Good morning, Interweb, World Builders Log 36. We are, as always, continuing to world build our fictional planet here, placeholder name Kretak. In the last videos, we finished up our temperature maps. So it is high, high time we get cracking with our climate zones. But first, some background info for anyone who's not been initiated. Long time world builders will be more than familiar with this map here. This is a map of the Köppen climate classification system. It's a widely used way of describing Earth's climates, and it's, I think, the most popular way of depicting climates on fantasy worlds in the world building community as well. So we are going to stick to the road well trodden and emulate this for my planet here, Kretak. The Köppen system defines climate zones based on temperature and precipitation, seasonal temperature and precipitation, and it divides things up into five broad groups, namely A climates, B climates, C climates, D climates, and E climates stunning naming system and within each of those immaculately named groups there's a bunch of like subclimates. So we are going to ease into things today and we're going to tackle the easiest of the climate groups to deal with and that is the E climates aka the polar slash alpine climates. Oh actually and before we crack into that just an important note here this map here is a map of climate zones it is not a map of earth's biomes. Climate zones and biomes are related, but they are not the same thing, and you can't use those two terms interchangeably. That is a thing I've never expressly stated in previous videos, so I just want to set the uh, record straight here. A TLDR, and way oversimplifying it because I don't want to get into it here, biomes at least in part are based on biological factors. Climate zones, at least in the Köppen climate classification system, are not. Right, back to our E climates, our polar climates. You'll see that they are divided into two subcategories here, ET climates and EF climates. ET climates are tundra climates, shown in the sort of like really difficult to see medium gray here. And the EF climates shown in the much easier to see dark gray here are ice cap climates. Okay, now I'm pretty sure we all know what a tundra climate zone looks like, but just as a little refresher, let's pop over to West Greenland. And this is basically it. The key sort of thing you'll find here is that there are basically no trees. Just a bunch of low vegetation. You got permafrost. It's a bit boggy. It's a bit swampy. You know, the tundra. Again, I'm sure we're all aware what ice cap climates look like. But if we pop on over to the Antarctic Peninsula, there you go. A typical ice cap climate. Just ice, ice and more ice. No vegetation and like basically no real life save for the odd gaggle of penguins and uh, whatever mad lad happens to be hiding out in this cute little red cabin. Now anyways, plotting these two climate zones on our fantasy worlds is dead easy. You'll see here the ice cap climate zone by definition occurs in regions where the average monthly temperature never exceeds zero degrees Celsius. You got to be freezing to build up all that ice, right? So for our worlds, all we got to do is mark in our ice cap climate zones in regions that are zero degrees Celsius or less in summer, like so. I just to be absolutely clear as to what we're looking at here. This is like a, a composite map. The top half of the map is Northern Hemisphere summer. The bottom half of the map is Southern Hemisphere summer. Like I'm overlaying the two summers together because it just made marking things out way easier. All right, that's it. That's our EF ice cap climate done. Zero degrees Celsius or less in summer ice cap. Gravy. Now our tundra climate, again definitionally, occurs in regions where the warmest month has an average temperature between zero and 10 degrees Celsius. So like before, we just we mark in a tundra climate zone in any region that's between zero and 10 degrees Celsius in summer, like so. Now remember, we are working with isotherms that are 6 degrees Celsius apart, so my 10 degree line would fall somewhere within this sort of like beigey, light yellowy zone. So there's a little bit of kind of like artistic license to where exactly you draw the boundaries if they don't neatly meet up with our isotherms that are 6 degrees Celsius apart. Also, make sure you meticulously check everything, like you'll notice here there's a little bit of a tundra zone happening inside the tropics because it's at elevation. So don't just assume that your tundra and ice caps are limited to the very low latitudes. Check everywhere. All right, and that, that's it done. Tundra, done. Ice caps, done. E-climates, done. We're good. All right, folks, thank you for watching. See y'all next time. Edgar out. But like, really, it's not over. You know me, you've seen these videos. 
this is but the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> Lol, iceberg. Get it? Glaciers, iceberg, ice caps. I I'll see myself out now. So now we know where our ice caps are, or more importantly, our ice sheets. We have to acknowledge the fact that ice sheets are thick with like three seas. Like the Antarctic ice sheet is like several kilometers thick in certain places. That adds elevation to our world, which in turn modifies the temperature. So I guess it's back to the tent layer of hell temperature mapping for me. So broadly speaking, we can think of like uh, the glaciers that form in these ice cap regions as coming in three flavors. They can be either ice sheets, ice caps, or ice fields. Many more glacier types exist, but at this sort of scale, those are the three I'm going to concern myself with. Ice sheets, think massive glaciers like Antarctica and Greenland. They can occur in ice cap climate zones that are 50,000 square kilometers or bigger in area, and that at least in part have low-lying regions associated with them. The other type, ice caps, they're something similar, except they'll occur in regions that are less than 50,000 square kilometers. And finally, ice fields occur exclusively in mountainous regions. Ice sheets and ice caps are known as unconstrained glaciers in that they just dominate the topography. They don't care about topography, they just overwrite it. Ice fields are constrained glaciers that kind of exist within the topography. Their shape is defined by the topography. So given all that, I went into G-plates and I measured kind of each sort of discrete ice cap climate zone I marked out here, measured its area and notated whether or not it was a sheet, a cap or a field. So if we zoom into say the south here, we can see all three types happening. This section here exists completely in highland regions. It's not down near the coast in low-lying regions at all. So I called it an ice field. All of these islands here, they do have some highland regions associated with them, but there's also some low-lying stuff here. And the ice cap climate zone is lying over all regions here. So this guy's a sheet and this guy's a sheet, these two big islands here, because they measure more than 50,000 square kilometers. Whereas these little tiny islands here are less than 50,000 square kilometers. So they're going to get marked as ice caps. And I did the same thing for every ice cap climate zone region on the planet. So now that I know the sort of dominant morphology of the glaciers that are forming in these ice cap regions, I can make some kind of good-ish guesstimations about uh, what elevation they will add to the world. So the first thing to note here is that for ice fields, I'm going to say that there's no change in elevation. Again, these are constrained glaciers, so they're kind of like, think of them as like fitting into the nooks and crannies of a sort of mountain range or mountain plateau. They're not growing over the mountain range and dwarfing it and dominating it. They're just sitting in the mountain range. So all of these ice cap regions along here are not going to add any elevation. So it's worth noting that this is an artistic choice on my part and quite frankly, a choice I made to keep my workflow down. I really, really didn't want to go in here and have to mess with all of the elevations everywhere. I just declared that any glaciers here do not overflow the mountains. But you could just as easily look at this and say, hey, these are vast swaths of land here, way bigger than 50,000 square kilometers. So the glaciers build up so much that they like spill out over the mountains and become like ice sheets proper. You could totally do that. I'm just being very lazy. Let's be real. So ice fields, no effects. Now for ice caps, to figure out how much ele elevation they add, there's no, or at least I don't think there is, or I haven't come across a mathematical formula to do this for you. So we have to resort to taking the average thickness of the ice caps we see on Earth, about 100 to 500 meters. We divide that by the planet's gravity because the higher the gravity, the more squat landforms would be. The lower the gravity, the higher things can build up. Whatever average thickness we get here, we multiply it by two, two times the average thickness to get the dome. Because unconstrained glaciers like ice sheets and ice caps, like if we imagine this is a section of land here, putting it kind of over simplistically, their shape would be something like this, where there's kind of like a high center point here. There can be a couple of, of high points in the middle here, but in the simplest case, there is a single kind of like high dome point. And that is given by two times the average thickness. So now on my world, even if I were to select the highest possible kind of Earth-like ice cap, given my planet's gravity, the added elevation is not going to be enough to drop the temperature appreciably. 
because remember we're working with isotherms that are six degrees Celsius apart. So we'll need to add at least a thousand meters of elevation in order for me to come in here and draw new isotherms, which we just would not get from this formula. So from my world, ice caps, they add elevation, but it's so minuscule that I don't need to mess with my temperature map. I will need to mess with my topography map, so uh, Patreon live stream, that's the thing I'll probably do there if you're interested, links in all the usual places. And so we come to the final one, the big boy, the ice sheet. These have the same morphology as ice caps, except they're just much, much, much bigger. We have to select an average thickness, scale that with gravity, multiply it by two to get our dome height. Now for, for values here, the average thickness of ice sheets on earth, they vary drastically. So let's just say less than 2.3 kilometers and you're okay. So for this particular ice sheet here, I got an average thickness of 1.75 kilometers and a dome height at 3.5, which is enough for it to override this topography, which I think only gets up to 2,000. No, it gets up to 3,000. And for the big giganto ice cap region in the south, same procedure applies. Uh, I made this extremely high. The idea being that this world is a little bit colder than Earth, so I really wanted to like push the height as much as I could to drop the temperatures as much as I can, while maintaining some modicum of realism. So average thickness about 2.1 in the south, the dome height at 4.2. Again, I need to stress you can have multiple domes. I was trying to keep my life easy and just had one dome per kind of discrete ice sheet. So with all that in the bag, I pop back into G-plates for another quick, not so quick, session where I marked out uh, the new topography that the ice sheets add. So these are topographic contours here at one kilometer intervals. Now, if you're going to do this yourself, pro tip, you want to have these contours be kind of spaced very evenly, unless you meet some sort of barrier, like say a shoreline, in which case they can stack quite tightly. Because this is what we see on Earth. And also just think of ice sheets, again, like, you know, squidging honey onto a surface. The sort of shape the honey forms as it kind of spreads out would be very akin to what ice sheets and ice caps are doing. And you can see here with the contour lines, these are really, really evenly spaced and they begin to kind of like get more densely packed as they reach the sea, as they reach a barrier. Same thing over here and here. So try and keep these contour lines. Don't look at this. This is really messy. There's lots of topography going on here. But for your big, chunky, thick boy ice sheets, keep those uh, contour lines equidistantly spaced. So yeah, I did this in the north here, and I also did this in the south. Uh, it's worth pointing out here, just a little fun fact. The tallest point in this dome is 4.2 kilometers. That actually represents the tallest point on the entire planet. So like this world's Everest is an ice dome, which I just think is pretty cool. So with these contours drawn in at 1000 meter intervals, and remembering from the previous video, links in all the usual places, that our temperature will drop six degrees per thousand meters of elevation gained. I popped into Blender and I appreciate that this looks like an absolute chaotic disaster, but trust me when I say this was organized chaos. This was me just moving the isotherms around in accordance with the stuff we talked about in the previous video to get a new set of isotherms based on the new topography. And from here, it was just a super simple, though a extremely time consuming case of going back and editing the temperature maps to factor all this in. So this is the temperature map for Northern Hemisphere winter without the temperature changes that our ice caps would necessarily bring. And this is the change that the ice caps make. So no ice caps. So check down here and here, check in the ice cap zone. No ice caps, ice caps, no ice caps, ice caps. So in the south here, we went from a balmy, balmy zero degrees Celsius in summer to a bone chilling negative 24 degrees in summer at the top of this ice dome. Okay, and here we are half a year later, Northern Hemisphere, summer this time. Remember, here's where our ice cap regions go and check for the temperature modifications in these regions. So before ice caps, after ice caps, before ice caps, after ice caps. We went from negative 48 degrees Celsius to negative 66 degrees and a little bit less with the ice caps. That's a stunning change. Now, I, I promise I'll, I'll stop talking now and I'll let you go, but this sort of thing just gets me really excited. So it's one more thing before I go. Picard here in the summer, right, is pretty chill. It's about, what, 15 degrees at the coast here and zero degrees definitionally at the edge of the kind of ice dome. 
Like, you could, in theory, just, like, walk that, and it would be pretty chill and lovely. Now, I'm sure there's, like, there would be adverse weather effects with this kind of mad temperature differential, but but at least in theory, it's pretty chill and accessible. And then, it, like, half a year later in winter, it's just like, nope, nope, you're not getting anywhere near there. The zero degree isotherm is, like, now on the bay. You're just not getting inland at all. Well, you're negative 24 within a couple of hundred kilometers of this bay. Like, that is just so cool, isn't it? A chill summer walk death a thousand ways. Ah, oh, you gotta love geography. And so with that, we are actually like for real done here. Tundra, ice caps, e-climates, done. And new temperature maps, done. Next time we're going to leave our fur coats behind and we're going to throw on our short shorts and sun hat and we're going to go figure out the tropical climates on this world, the A-climates. So I hope you'll join me for that. Thank you for watching. Thanks to the patrons for supporting the show. And a final massive thanks to friend of the show, Ross Beggio, for the continued geographic advice. Right, that's me. Until next time, Edgar Rouse.